topic is advanced alignment diagnostics. I would like to take just a minute to um, introduce our panel today. So with us today are our co-presenters. That would be Lonnie from Southwest Montana. Wave Lonnie. Lonnie's getting ready for this. Uh, we've got Jerry Stewart. Jerry works with Lonnie out in the Butte, Montana area. He's going to be co-presenting also. Uh, Jeff Miller is with us. Jeff is our technology manager at CTI and keeps all the loose ends tied together. Um, Brandon is uh, coming to us to help monitor chat and monitor Q&A, and he'll be presenting next week, so stay tuned for that. You can well, hello guys, nice to see everybody here today. Um, we're gonna be talking today about uh, the dynamic alignment, and uh, I'm gonna define that a little clearer as we go, but uh, we wanna see things that um, kind of elude us between the time it's on our rack and we set all of our angles up, and we get everything set to specifications, and some differences we can have as when it's driving down the road. Um, we're going to explore some, some issues that have to do with uh, suspension geometry changes, uh, some steering arm issues that we can have for our steering angle geometry, and also uh, I see we have a question and answer. Uh, we already have a request for some scrub radius information. We're going to be talking about scrub radius in detail and how that kind of affects where we go um, once the vehicle leaves the rack, what kind of effects does it have on the dynamic tow compared to the static tow condition? So we wanna make sure we kinda get through those issues. Um, I've been doing alignments for, for many, many years. Uh, I had alignment rack in my shop and always took pride on doing a very good alignment and uh, getting the vehicle as close to the preferred specs and all the best practices that go along with alignment. So for today's purpose, um, we're not gonna skip any of those. Uh, we're not, not forgetting that that is one of our main goals, but one of the directions that we really wanna focus on today would be the change to the toe angle. Um, so you'll hear a few best practices as we go through this, but we're really gonna check and uh, try to uh, you know, confirm what we're missing when the alignment's on the alignment rack. I'm gonna ask, I wanna bring Jerry in here for a second. I'm gonna ask him, um, what do you think we concentrate the most on when a technician comes into our shop and we show him the alignment rack? Well, in, in my experience, when a guy comes in, you know, shops are very busy and are orientated for production. We have to get them in and out. We have to make money. So what we want to expose a, a new person to really is all the angles. How do I actually obtain the angles? Not so much what the angles mean and what effect they're going to have on driving or tire wear or anything like that. What we're really trying to do is tell them, here's caster, here's how to adjust it. Here's camber, here's how to adjust it. Here's toe, and of course, again, here's how you adjust it. So instead of going through all the theory and what, what causes a vehicle to wander, what causes a vehicle to pull when, when you hit the brakes, we kind of miss all of that. And so we're really just trying to get them orientated to be able to use the machine, find the adjustments, maybe use the proper tool to make the adjustment, and get it out the door. And I think that's where I came from. And I think that's where a lot of people came from. The problem with that is if you, if you have a vehicle that's maybe been in an accident and it's been masked by a very good body shop to where it looks perfect, but something is off a bit, something is bent, the symmetry of the vehicle isn't right on. We have axle setback that maybe we're not aware of. Uh, things like that, our scrub radius, which we'll get into, has been altered. Some of those things have caused driving conditions that you just can't fix with static alignments. And to be honest with you, Lonnie, in, in the early days of alignment, and you're, you're a lot better at this than I am, but I struggled with getting the alignment to spec and then making it drive correctly. And so many times I went and bought new tires or had customers buy new tires. And to be honest with you, we even had a rule of thumb at one time, you could only buy Michelin tires because we couldn't seem to make anything else drive correctly. So if we couldn't get it aligned correctly with the specs or you know, we lined it to the specs and it still didn't drive good, guess what it became? It had to become a tire issue at that point, right? 
And so that's where we were at. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. I think turning the machine on, here's how you do a rollback compensation, here's how you get your measurements, here's the uh, specifications, try to get it as close as you can. And I think that's where the topic kind of usually is. And, and I agree, I know that's how we have to do it in the industry, but there becomes a lot of, uh, you know, issues you run into, like Jerry said, over the years where you run into these vehicles that just, you can't fix them with a proper alignment. There's some hidden issues. And so that's kind of where we're going today. And I threw up a screen here of alignment capture and for no other reason, just to try to introduce, we've done a really good job on this alignment. This would be accepted in most shops as, as ready to print out for the customer. Uh, our toe angle is set to specs. The static toe from the specification from the manufacturer is right in the middle of the specification. We have a total of one tenth of a degree of toe in on this vehicle, and we split it into individual toe here. So, of, of you know, uh, so it's even on both sides. We got our cast. Our caster looks fairly good. I'll come back to that in a second. Our camber, um, tad bit on the negative side, but it's even. Um, that could be because of spring sag or something or that issue, but we have our caster angle. We've got 4.1 degrees on the left side and we got 4.3 degrees on the right side. And I'm going to say that that's in the right relationship and it's right in the middle of the specification. Now, when I talk about relationship with caster, um, I like to see it if it's, if it's not even or depending on where you live or so, you know what specs they are, the right side can be a little bit higher than the left side. And you guys that are paying attention there on chat, um, would you just throw something up in chat and tell me why I don't mind having a little more caster on the right side of the vehicle than the left side of the vehicle. And while you're doing that chat exercise here, um, we'll kind of look at some of the other things and Randy, if you wouldn't mind taking a look at that rear and tell me on a modern vehicle, this is pretty good on an older vehicle. I got the rear toe set fairly well, but you and I were doing a little talking earlier and you said that sometimes today that may not be paying close enough attention to some of the angles back there. Well, you're absolutely correct, Lonnie. Uh, this would be a perfectly acceptable alignment on an older vehicle. But on new vehicles, particularly vehicles with ADOS systems, forward-facing technology like uh, radar and forward-facing cameras, that's a pretty bad error. And this is why um, most, if not all, are calibrated according to the center line of the body on the vehicle, not necessarily thrust angles. So a prerequisite to doing a good calibration is to make sure that thrust angle is correct. This thrust angle is close for an older vehicle, but it's not correct for an ADOS equipped vehicle. And here's why, let's just put a number to that. Uh, one degree of deviation uh, from in thrust angle from the body center line is equal to about 63, 64 inches at 100 yards and double that at 200 yards and so on and so forth. So that little bit of uh, half a degree right now equates to about a 30 inch error or a little more uh, from a radar system or a uh, camera system. So that's definitely gonna affect the performance of that ADOS system. Absolutely, thank you for that, Randy. Um, I was looking in chat here, it looks like everybody's kind of got that I'm okay with the relationship because of road crown, and that's absolutely correct. Because of the uh, crown of the road, it's okay to have a little more positive caster on the right hand of the vehicle to allow the vehicle to pull itself back towards center up the hill. So that 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 looks pretty good. But um, you know, earlier in my career, um, we've we've always tried to. I had this pictured in my head. Uh, trying to get guys to do a good job and, and to do lots of jounces and man, sometimes it's starting a vehicle to make sure the center of the steering wheel is right and, and doing uh, repeatable caster sweeps so that we knew that it was as close as it was. But in my mind, I kind of got a built up that I was actually, the alignment was on the alignment rack. And so I want to bring up this point here first today before we go any further is our specifications are geared towards the static position, which would be on the alignment rack, um, you know, level alignment rack, um, and no forces from the road acting upon the suspension. Um, and when I go to print that alignment out, the uh, vehicle, the wheels are pointed straight ahead. And so that's where my toe, um, my total toe comes from. Uh, my camber and caster reading is from those positions. But, uh, you know, we could kind of learn over the years that engineers were after something a little different than that. 
And uh, most of our specifications are made for a dynamic alignment condition, which would be the vehicle in motion, driving down the road with road forces acting upon it. Uh, engineers like to pick, uh, you know, like a steady cruise condition because they hope that's the condition that the uh, car, vehicle, truck, whatever is in most of the time. Um, so that's going to be the norm for tire wear. They'll pick that dynamic condition um, to get static type specifications to match what we want the vehicle to do driving down the road. So as the vehicle drives down the road, it's got steady cruise, it's got acceleration, it's got braking, it's got all these different forces working upon the uh, suspension and steering and the tires in specific when we're talking about scrub radius. Um, and so all of that has to be taken into consideration. So the alignment specs are, that you know we're so good at trying to drill down to and trying to meet all the time and get as close as we can, they're static specifications and they're there to predict what's gonna happen to the vehicle as it's going down the road. So today, we're gonna give you these three different scenarios when something bends or something can shift or something alters the scrub radius that can really make your uh, alignment specifications that you have almost still relevant because the uh, conditions under driving down the road have changed so much. So, um, Jerry, just so when we're driving down the road, um, we think about this, uh, you know, the goal of the toe angle is to be pretty close to zero. Is that correct? Yes. Otherwise, if we get off, let's say one sixteenth of an inch, which doesn't sound like much when you're looking at a ruler, uh, one sixteenth inch seems small, but it's quite a bit in the alignment angles. But one sixteenth of an inch would be the same as sliding that tire uh, sideways down the road about seven feet every quarter of a mile. If you extend that up to 100 miles, it's like sliding it a quarter of a mile sideways down the road. So you're just basically tearing the rubber off, uh, ruining your tire by scrubbing it down the road. And you don't, you know, you can't tell that driving the car maybe, uh, but you can tell it when you have to go buy new tires. <laughs> Absolutely, and tires, tires are not cheap anymore. Um, one thing Brandon kind of posted up there in chat, he, he asked me, he goes, are newer vehicles more stringent regarding the alignment specs? And I believe, yes, we, it, they are, but um, it, a lot of it still rests on us on what kind of job and what kind of best practices or what you're going to allow to be normal. The process takes a lot longer, as, as Randy has um, brought to the industry in, in, in a lot of the ADIS training that we have. Um, the time it takes to do an alignment is, is a lot more than it used to be. We got forward facing cameras and, and all kinds of stuff that are involved in that. So yes, more stringent and very time consuming. Yeah. Lonnie, if I can add to that, this, is, this ties right into Bernie's question about tighter specs for ADOS and uh, therefore being in the green would still be okay. Well, no, not necessarily. Um, it's the technician's responsibility to make sure that that thrust angle is correct. And for an ADOS car, correct is zero. Uh, and whether or not it's green or not in the green is immaterial. Uh, you need to know that those specifications are as close as you can possibly get. Absolutely. So thank you for, for dump, chiming in there, uh, Randy. I appreciate that. Um, well, it brings up a question since we're talking here. Uh, a lot of a lot of times, if especially if you're forced to do alignments on flat rate, we need to have some conversations on how these alignments are sold. So I'm not talking about your special alignment here when we dive into these angles. I'm talking about when you have to do these other procedures and you're in diagnostic parts, um, that's usually not, when I started out, 1995 for the alignment, right? So uh, that's not included in the uh, 1995 alignment. So. Um, we need to kind of be aware of the extra time that it's going to take to do these systems right. Um, so the first thing that we're going to talk about changing the dynamic angles going down the road is going to be related to bushings. And bushings are something that they're kind of difficult to check with a dry park. Uh, it doesn't always show up on your dry park. That may be all that the uh, shop requires where you work out or whatever. But um, it takes a little more uh, effort to actually see if a bushing's good or not. And a lot of bushings can kind of squeak by for a time. And uh, one of the practices I developed early on was using a pry bar and prying these things in a couple of different directions 
until Jerry showed me this tool. Jerry, you want to talk about this tool for a second? Sure. Before we go to the tool, I just want to add one thing to what you guys were saying. I work with a shop uh, and he, he had bought an alignment machine and he's trying to charge out what the tire shops are charging out and the other shops in his area charging out. And he says, I just can't make any money with this alignment machine because he's trying to really make a chassis adjustment, not do an alignment. And I said, well, you really need to relabel it. And he did. Uh, an alignment is just setting everything to the green, letting it go. A chassis adjustment is taking uh, consideration the symmetry of the vehicle and getting everything set correctly, uh, the relationships with one another. So he actually can, you know, change the name to chassis adjustment if he had to, to charge out more for that. But this tool is a time saver. Uh, the tool is something we ran across a few years ago, and as Lonnie pointed out, we really need to check the bushings. Make sure the suspension is not moving one direction or the other when we accelerate or we decelerate, because that's going to change the direction that we're driving. So we've always grabbed big pry bars. What's the problem with the pry bars? Finding a place to pry. And then while you're prying, can you look at the same time? And it, it gets very difficult. So how much uh, stress are you putting on the part with the pry bar? It's really hard to tell. So this tool kind of took all the guesswork out. Now for the sake of this video coming up, uh, we did this with the handle on the outside, but this tool flips around, the handle can be on the inside. But as you can see, that we actually lower the weight of the car back down on the tool. And as we put the weight on the car on the tool, we set the brake so the wheel cannot rotate as we're doing this. Now that tool can be used two different directions. Here we're using it longitudinally. And so we're checking the bushings going fore and aft to make sure we don't have too much movement there. Then we can switch this around and do lateral movements back and forth that way on each wheel. And so this allows us, if we flip the handle around to the inside, so you can move it up and down, back and forth, whatever the case may be, and you can watch the bushings as well with a good light flashlight. Case of the video here, we put somebody underneath so they could watch the bushings, and we moved it back and forth just to show how the tool worked a little bit better. But this tool is put out by a company called Mueller. Uh, the part number is a 432-910, if anybody's interested in that tool. When we always called it the work zig, because that's what it was labeled. And uh, we didn't know what the work zig meant for a long time, but it just meant tool. <laughs> yeah, my German's a little rusty, guys. So uh, it's actually work zig, and I had no idea. Um, Looking at the uh, bushing there on the screen, guys, and uh, there's quite a bit of movement right there. And some of the uh, conversation we've had in the other two classes has centered around, well, how much movement is too much before I condemn that, that bushing? And some of the best answers uh, that we've, we've got for that is, is there really a symptom? Are you having a alignment come back with repeated slight feathering or a little toe wear on the inside of the tire um, is the customer still complaining about the way the vehicle handles and those kind of things because you know bushing movements really not a spec a lot of times that we get we want to see that bushing kind of snap back to center in both directions um, cracking is not always a good indicator uh, bushings that are really bad, we can use a catch. Bushings that are marginal, maybe not so much. This tool puts really good leverage on it so it gets the bushing to move if there's play. So um, I would say um, if we're having a symptom, okay, we're going to look and make sure that the play is not too much because if we start shifting that control arm, think of our alignment angles that we worked on on the alignment rack to get them in the static position as close as possible. Think about what that's going to do when it goes down the road. The other thing is if I have a questionable bushing, I wanna make sure I do both sides and compare them and see if they're uh, the same amount of movement or if they're snapping back on both sides the same. So that's a couple of tips in that particular instance. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is uh, guys, we kind of covered the first topic here. When things change and shift in the suspension, we can change the way our dynamic angles go down the road. I'm going to bring out something else that changes with suspension geometry that we don't always think about. And sometimes it's um, in Montana, typically it's the frame angle because we don't have the horse trailer or the camper on the back of it changing how the vehicle is used. And so that brings up another point that came up the other day is what if the driver of the vehicle is plus sized and uh, really makes a difference in ride height on one side? 
Um, unfortunately, we do have to take these things into consideration because the uh, geometry of the steering shifting on one side to the other can really change our static alignment angle when it's in the dynamic position. So there's other things other than the shifting bushings that we talked about that can cause those type of problems. The next scenario that we want to talk about here is going to um, cover changes in steering arm geometry. And I got to do a little engineering stuff here for a second, but hang with me. The actual um, idea really can help us understand um, what changes sometimes, because remember our goal was to make everything right in the static position. Um, the static position's good, but things change when we turn going down the road too, um, meaning that you can spend um, the ample amount of time to get your rear toe and your front toe set really well in the straight ahead position on the alignment rack. But when we go ahead and we put the vehicle in motion, those things can change in the turn. So we're gonna introduce something called Ackerman or tow out in turns. So while I talk about this, see if you guys can raise your hands, how many guys have heard of the Ackerman principle or tow out in turns? Just go ahead and raise your hand up and leave it up for a second so we can kind of tally up how we're doing right there. So just leave your hands up there. So Ackerman and tow out in turns. The idea behind the Ackerman principle is this. If you have a vehicle and the wheels are traveling when we're turning around a corner, kind of like the illustration we have here, the tires tend to follow a different arc, meaning the circle is bigger on the outside than it is the inside. And so if we put our physics thinking together, we say, okay, so um, it takes less turning to turn in a larger arc than it does a smaller arc. Um, that being said, if both turns or excuse me, tires turned at the same degree when we're going around a corner, this tire on the outside would actually be trying to turn around the arc on the inside. Now, it doesn't sound like that's very significant, but it really is because it'll cause squealing on the tires and tire wear and feathering and some really weird handling problems if the Ackerman principle or the tow out and turn uh, is not implemented right. Um, the term tow out and turn comes from this tire happened to be towed out a little bit to take a lot larger circle or arc around there. So it's towed out from the inside tire. Typically we see two, let's just say two degrees. I'll talk about some variances in a minute, but two degrees for tow out in turns at a 20 degree turn. So if we had the inside tire going 20 degrees, we may have the outside tire only turning 18 degrees so that they both travel around those arcs properly. Um, one thing you guys can relate this to something else we know too is the inside tire uh, turns slower than the outside tire. That's the reason why we have a differential, um, you know, in the rear and the front and in many cases uh, to allow the tire speed differences to uh, accommodate for the different size circles. And if you look at this illustration, even the rear tires follow a little different arc as they go. So tire spinning at the different speeds, if you try to make this tire turn the same speed as this tire, you're going to get a squeal. Um, that's about as much force as the wrong tow out and turns angle will give you. So just to be clear, a vehicle wants to turn around a common center point when it goes around. Now our illustration's a little short here, so I apologize for that, but Ackerman principle, which uh, would say that this line that extends through the rear axle both ways, um, all the way through there, and the line perpendicular, so this isn't quite 90 degrees, but if it was perpendicular, that tire would extend its perpendicular line to that rear axle center line, and so would this tire. And if it's set up correctly, these will join at one common center point, so no matter where we're turning the vehicle, they will always meet at the same point on the rear axle line. And that's a proper Ackerman angle. Um, there's some things that can kind of change that if you're working with modified vehicles. I don't know how many guys may work on motor homes, uh, conversion motor homes or limousines or anything of that nature. Uh, Jerry was kind of talking to me about this the other day about how um, some of that can change the Ackerman principle if you're not aware of it. 
Well, of course, the Ackerman, to me, it reminds me of a guy flying a toy plane on a string, right? You're flying around, you're holding the string, and the, and the uh, airplane is flying around in a complete circle. Well, you can predict the radius of that circle exactly, correct? So if you start changing that center point by moving the string back and forth, all of a sudden your circle changes, the radius of your circle changes. So you start to develop some instability there. So that's kind of what that reminds me of. So when they engineer these, obviously they try to engineer that center point uh, so that we can pivot around it. What's going to change that? Well, I used to work for Toyota back in the mid 80s and the mid 80s we didn't have extended cab Toyotas at the time. Toyotas were very small. People wanted bigger Toyotas so we used to send them out to a frame company and they would actually extend the frames and at that time I'd never heard of Ackerman so I have no idea if they made any correction to that or not. And then I, I love watching uh, modifications on TV and custom bills. And I get to look in at the Diesel Brothers and man, they've got a six door truck. Who, who wouldn't want a six door truck, right? And so they have to lengthen the frame and I'm not sure if they're making adjustments for the Ackerman or not. Of course, stretch limousines and going back to the days with motorhomes and all of those kind of things. Uh, this is something that we definitely need to pay attention to. And I'm not sure that uh, the custom custom shops are doing that I couldn't tell you that's good to know I want to clear up something that that was kind of on chat I probably talked over and didn't quite get it clear enough but when we're going around a corner there is a toe out condition because of the two different arcs we're, we're turning the inside tire turns more than the outside tire I think I might have thrown a toe out in there and kind of got it jumbled up I see we kind of got it fixed on chat but the inside tire course has got a um, follow a tighter arc. So as it turns more, it creates a little toe out uh, condition on the front. So that's where we get our name for toe out on turns. Um, okay, so how do you how do you do that? That's that's where we're going here today. I mean, it's a great concept, and I love uh, physics and engineering and stuff. But um, in order to change your toe from being you know close to zero degrees in all relative aspects on the alignment rack with the steering wheel level and it pointed in the straight ahead position um, to towing out, something has to change because we're talking about mechanical tie rods connecting to a mechanical rack or a steering gear or a drag link or something. So um, most of the uh, the uh, Ackerman principle comes from the design of the steering angle. I mean, there's some influences there with, with width and different things like that, but we have our steering arm on our steering knuckle here, and we got a picture of it. And what we see is this steering arm here is positioned in such a way with an angle relating to the steering knuckle that when you have four inches of linear movement one direction compared to four inches linear movement of the tie rod in the other direction pulling this knuckle around, you're going to have a difference in degree because of that precisely designed angle right there. Um, not to get too deep in it, but that angle is so close that if you drew a line from the top upper ball joint through the bottom ball joint and created your SAI line, which we'll talk about in a minute, but if you created that line and you went from that line through the center of your tie rod end connection point and continued to the rear of the vehicle, um, both sides, both steering knuckles, those angles would meet directly in the middle of the rear axle. So that's not a lot of tolerance. That's pretty precise. And because of that, when we turn, we're going to get a little different degree or what we hope is going to give us the right toe out in turn. So um, I, I, this is made out of cast iron here. It looks pretty healthy. I don't know where this part came from. Um, so I want Jerry to kind of help me here on this part here. There's some things that can go wrong with this angle that uh, that's pretty common. What you got, buddy? Well, some things that can go wrong is me hitting it with the hammer. So oh. I, I was always taught how to get tie rod ends off in the past was get my hammer. And of course, if that doesn't work, what's the rule? You get a bigger hammer, right? And so we basically trying to beat on that to loosen up the fit of the tie rod as it goes through there, as it necks down. And sometimes we could bend that. And if we bend it now, we have changed our toe out on turns. Or let's say that we hit a curb strike. 
we had a real harsh curb stripe that could bend it as well or maybe we've got one that was misengineered from maybe it's a knockoff part you know a little less expensive and it wasn't engineered and, and built correctly and we put that on and the only way to really know that is you won't see it on your static alignment uh, and the only way to really know it is check your toe out on turns during the alignment procedure so if you're not doing that, then the other way that you might notice it is during a test drive, you could hear the tires squealing a little bit uh, or something of that nature, a little instability into the turns uh, because th it won't show up until you start turning. And the more you turn, the more degrees you turn, the worse it's going to be. Absolutely. So let's quit talking about it. Let me show you on this nice little animation here. This animation is going to start off and the vehicles are going to be showed in the front, uh, front right and front left. It's going to show zero degrees. That's going to represent the dynamic toe we talked about earlier. That's kind of our goal um, for lack of tire wear. So we're going to start off with a healthy car and we're just going to show the relationship here as it's going down the road. It's zero now. Uh, and we're going to make the corner and when we get around the corner we're going to notice that the inside tire had to turn 20 degrees to uh, the 18 degrees on the outside. That is pretty consistent with our Ackerman principle because uh, we have a larger tire out, uh, excuse me, circle out here than we do on the inside. Next we're going to show you after we complete the corner here, we're going to show you that something's changed on this vehicle. Now this is the one we're talking about today. Uh, the steering arm and its geometry in relationship to everything else is bent, so maybe a curb strike. And this is the part that can be unknown if this vehicle has been to a lot of shops, but it comes into a shop, the toe setting's out. So, you know, at this point, the technician may be worried about, man, can I get the toe back into spec? Okay, so let me pause right there and talk about that. So the toe is out by quite a ways. What changed it? You know, that's some of the critical thinking skills we got to kind of think of. I know for myself, um, in my younger days, getting it back to the preferred spec was probably, I probably figured, who knows what I figured, right? But I never took into consideration that the arm was bent. So the, I, the guy aligned it again. Now it's back to where it's driving in a straight line properly with very little dynamic toe. Um, but let's see how it reacts when it's going around the corner here. So now, with the bent arm in this illustration, uh, the inside tire turned 20 degrees and so did the outside tire. And what that's gonna cause is a little bit of tire squeal. So we see the uh, black mark extending out from the back of the tire right there. They're no longer turning in the right relationship with one another. So you're gonna miss that if you're looking at it in a static position because the dynamic toe out and turns is what really changes and we need it to be going around a corner. So um, how would you know the guy before you hasn't done a correction like that? And uh, a couple of the ideas, you know, might be, you know, you might be able to uh, take it out and do some parking lot maneuvers. Maybe the customer's talking about tire squeal being an issue. And uh, that's true. That very well could be. Um, maybe they're coming in with a complaint that uh, the tires are wearing funny one side to the other. Um, or uh, maybe it's just a handling problem when they go into corners, maybe one direction worse than the other direction, right? So the best way to do it is to, to go ahead and measure it. Well, some alignment machines make it very easy. Uh, they have Ackerman tests and Ackerman error calculations and things uh, already incorporated into the software. Um, there's also another way to do it if you have a turn uh, plate that has a degree dial on the turn plate. So uh, we'll talk about a couple of those here, but our goal when we're looking at toe out turn on turns is to make sure that the inside wheel reaches 20 degrees before the outside wheel does. Um, and so uh, the tip here, um, Jerry, we have, a, we have to make sure that we do what? We have to make sure that we set the toe properly before we even do this test. Is that correct? Yes, we, we definitely want the toe set before we do the, these are diagnostic angles, right? The angles that we're really coming up with right now, toe out on turns, and then we're gonna hit scrub radius. These are gonna be diagnostic angles. So, and before you get into diagnostics, you have to make sure your other angles are set correctly. Uh, you know, it's just like diagnosing an engine. 
you don't want to go in and look at the ignition system when you got bad compression, when the engine is no good. So we want to make sure everything else is good before we head down these diagnostic angle pathways for sure. So, you know, just to put that into a scenario, uh, I used to have other shops in my area and I was a nice guy, I know that, but they would go ahead and replace all the front end parts for me before they had their customer bring their vehicle out for me to align because they didn't have an alignment rack. And I think that's, that could be common or whatever. So it has new components on it and the toes way off. Well, I can't check to see if anything's bent on that vehicle until I establish the alignment, bring everything back in spec, get it zeroed in there. And now you better believe I'm going to do a tow out and turn measurement. Um, so to do it on alignment rack, uh, some of them will do five degree turns um, in increments, I'm going to show you at 10 degrees and I'm going to show you at 15 and 20. Um, so it'll kind of do it in a, uh, you know, a variety of angles, both sides, both left, both right, so that it gets an idea of the curve of tow out and turns. And the reason I say that is tow out and turns isn't linear, meaning uh, the first 10 degrees, the tire doesn't tow out a whole bunch. There's not a lot of tow out between the tires. Um, the next five degrees may be more, and even when I get to 20 degrees, I have more toe out, so it gains toe out the sharper you turn. And at 30 degrees or 35 degrees, there can be a lot of toe out. So, you know, we think about setting the toe on the front of the vehicle, we're talking tenths of a degree. Um, we're talking toe out turn on turns at 35 degrees going around a corner. Um, a pretty sharp corner, we could be talking, you know, five, six, seven, eight degrees of tow out, uh, depending on, you know, how long the vehicle is. So um, as we go look at this one here at 10 degrees, we got almost a half a degree at 10 degrees. We're going to continue to tow it out to almost 15, or to, excuse me, turn it to 15 degrees. And now we're going to almost have a degree of separation between the inside and outside tire. And at 20 degrees on our turntable, uh, we see that we have almost a degree and a half of tow out and turns. Um, All right. If throw a question here, real quick. Yep. These alignment, these diagnostic angles that we're talking about today, is this some, something we should anticipate doing on every alignment we see, or is this the ones that that uh, exhibit symptoms or noise or, or tire wear that keeps coming back? I think we do a proper inspection on every one of them and we keep in mind the suspension components have to stay where they're supposed to be. Um, and I think tow out in turns is really only one step further on your alignment machine. And I think it's almost when I get through this brand, and this is a great point, I think it's almost impossible to tell if that steering arm is bent. So I'm just saying it's a check. If you're doing best practices, you should know about this because um, of the, the issues that we have. And I, I did kind of say up front, I, I understand the fact that you have very little time to do the alignment and the tie rod end was froze and the uh, camber adjustments wouldn't move and all of that kind of stuff. But I, I do think it is very important to keep in our mind in the back of our head that just because it's good at straight ahead position, that doesn't mean we don't have a, you know, covered up problem in the vehicle. So that's very good. Um, I'm just going to look at these two on here on the screen right here. And uh, I'll, I'll get back to you, Jerry. Um, and just look at the separation in my tow out in turns compared to this vehicle compared to that vehicle. And when I start getting four to five degrees of tow out, um, there could be something very wrong. I want to check this from side to side. For one thing, the length of the vehicle um, will make a difference if this is a long vehicle or for, you know like a pickup truck that's way too much tow out for the turn at 20 degrees. Jerry go ahead. Oh I just wanted to add uh, to Brandon's question was the vehicle in for tires and we're just aligning it because we're putting new tires on it or was the vehicle in because the customer had a driving complaint wandering pulling to one direction or something like that that would have a lot of influence of how many checks i'm going to make that's all i wanted to add lonnie sorry about that uh, hey one thing i wanted to add to that lonnie is uh, yes, sir. when i first started doing a, a line that you taught me something to do was look at the relationship of the steering knuckle where the tie rod hooks uh, attaches 
from that point over to the wheel, measure that difference. And, and, then, I, and then after we got to see in the later alignment machines with, that were way more accurate, I got to thinking we're measuring that in inches and now we're looking for a one degree. I don't know how accurate that was when I was actually performing it. You know, sticking your finger between the steering arm and, and maybe the steering knuckle, you know, if it's bent bad, you're going to catch it. If it's only a little bit, though, you might miss it. There is another test, guys, that, that we can do for this. Um, and, and this is an old school test that I used to do. Uh, I used to lock my turn plates with the steering wheel in this, the straight ahead position so that the tires couldn't rotate. And then I would sit there and I would jounce that car up and down by the bumper and work the suspension while I had somebody else look at the steering wheel. If the steering wheel was walking, you know, going back and forth, what that told me was when the suspension was moving the same arc, that it was feeding back to my steering wheel. So that could be a, uh, you know, rack and pinion not level. It could be a number of things, but it also could be my steering angle on my uh, steering arm might be different too. And I'm getting a little bit of variance there. So that's a very good way to just kind of rough in and see if you have a problem if you haven't, haven't you know, uh, checked it on the alignment machine. All right, so now we're going to get to something a little more, um, in depth, we're going to move to changes in scrub radius. Uh, this is the other thing that can kind of hide in our dynamic alignment if we're not aware of it. So I want to hands up or down and leave your hand up for a little bit, but I'm gonna ask a question. How many of you guys see uh, your customers coming in with aftermarket rims, aftermarket wheels, aftermarket tires? In our area, it's kind of common. It's one of the first things guys do to kind of customize their vehicle. They'll put on rims and tires kind of make the appearance kind of their own, make them look a little bit more off-road. So this is just a picture of one choice a customer has made. Um, back in the day, um, you know, the tire shop, my local tire shop, and uh, my parts guy, my counter guy down there had a book that would tell me about wheel offsets and, and to make sure that, that my tire and wheel combination was going to fit over my caliper and tie rod ends and all that kind of stuff. And there was a person involved in it. But um, these type of alterations now, what Jerry and I have noticed is some of them will slip through the cracks that cause a huge issue with scrub radius because a lot more people are buying them where, Jerry? Well, we buy everything online, especially when we're quarantined. How do we even go to the shop, right? So, so we look up to see what's going to fit on our truck and we actually look at what we like, you know, what it look, what the look is and we order those up and put them on with absolutely no idea what the wheel offset is or how it's going to scrub, uh, affect our scrub radius or anything like that. So I think we have, I think we run into more of that now than we used to. I think that's what we decided basically. And I'm all about it. Um, so I like to modify stuff and change stuff, but it's got to be done correctly uh, to avoid some scenarios where a little bit of tweak on the angles or something's not going to correct it. So um, excuse me, I don't even know if this is a real word or not, but I call these kind of morphodite vehicles. They're kind of thrown together. They got huge wide tires on them and they're just not well planned out if you ask me. So let's talk about it because tire and rims are, uh, very common in probably most of our areas. And uh, what effect is what we're gonna try to direct that to is what effect would, would alterations have on the dynamic toe angle? And so to do that, we gotta jump out there with uh, SAI, which is steering axis inclination and scrub radius and talk about how engineers design our specs for our toe uh, that we set it on the alignment rack and what effect these rims and tires can have on it. So very first of all, I wanna talk about SAI. Uh, back in the day, this was kingpin inclination, but we're gonna call it SAI. Um, and it's gonna be an angle that is measured from true vertical, so straight up and down. And we're gonna be looking at this from the front of the car. And we're looking for a imaginary line here, the blue line drawn between the upper pivot point and the lower pivot point. And it really establishes the angle that the tire is going to have to turn around when we turn the wheel. Um, this is the same line and we establish it through the same points as we would if we were looking from the side of the vehicle. But when we're looking from the side of the vehicle, we call that the caster angle. Okay, so this is the steering axis inclination angle 
it adds stability and steering wheel returnability and everything that Castor did, but we're gonna view it from the front of the vehicle here. Now, this angle, we have lots of stuff we can use it for. We're not gonna get in today. Uh, the SAI, the included angle, and camber can be used to find multiple bent components on the front end, and that's a topic for another class. But as far as scrub radius is concerned, we gotta know how this angle is established because depending on what kind of system you have, uh, the SAI angle can be anywhere from three degrees to 20 degrees. Uh, short long arms can actually use a little bit less. We have three to five here. Most of the time on a short long arm suspension, one of these ball joints can be adjusted in relationship to the frame or to vertical. And we do that when we're adjusting camber. So whether you got a cam eccentric on the upper control arm or a cam eccentric on the bottom control arm, or maybe you've got a shin pack, okay? But whatever it is, um, it can move one of these ball joints in and out in relationship with the other. So again, just like with toe out and turns, it's very necessary very necessary to make sure that we do a proper best practice alignment, try to get it as close to spec before we can trust our SAI line. Um, now that being said, um, looking at time here, I want to kind of make sure I don't uh, miss this. Uh, scrub radius is a uh, determination between the tire center line and the SAI line as it comes down through the steering knuckles. So we're gonna use the tire center line, not true vertical, but the very center of that tire in relation to our steering axis inclination line. And we're gonna use the road surface as kind of our measuring point for scrub radius. Scrub radius isn't a degree, it's an in inches. So this little spot right here, the length between the tire center line and the SAI line, that's measured in inches, that's our scrub radius. Now, you guys know where the SAI line was established through the pivot points? That means that the tire is gonna turn around that point right there where the red line intersects the road surface. The tire's gonna have to turn around that point because the steering's making it, okay? So when we're talking about scrub radius, we gotta know what positive scrub radius is, and that's any time the SAI lands on the inside of the center line of the tire. Negative scrub radius, we see SAI lands on the outside of the center line of the tire. And zero scrub radius would be if it met at the very same point at the road surface, the tire center line, and the SAI line. Now, going back here, we'll talk about the importance of the scrub radius. And so I'm gonna use a term, I'm gonna introduce levers. Um, and so when I'm talking about levers, I'm specifically looking at the SAI line where it intersects the road. Now, if we take that point and it's positive scrub radius like we have in our picture and we come out to the inside of the tire, that is one lever. It's gonna be a little shorter than the outside lever on the tire. And the reason I'm saying lever is because it goes right into leverage, which is how I'm gonna to use to explain what scrub radius does to the toe. So I got a short lever on the inside, I got a long lever on the outside. Now I'm gonna apologize here for a second because the picture I got is of a front wheel drive car, but I'm gonna use a rear wheel drive example to try to get our heads wrapped around this before I go to front wheel drive and you'll see why. If this was a rear wheel drive vehicle with no axles, anything here, that tire would be being pushed down the road. As the road surfaces contact the tire, it's actually gonna be pushing back on the tire because friction's gonna to wanna to push against our levers. So my question is, if one lever is bigger than the other, the outside lever being bigger than the inside lever because of where the SAI line intersects the, the road surface, okay, what reaction will the tire have? Well, you guys know you put extensions on your breaker bars all the time. If you got a cheater pipe on that wrench, you have more force than you have with just the wrench itself. So when we're relating to scrub radius in a rear wheel drive application, if we're pushing on these levers, the outside lever will tend to turn the tire more around the steering axis inclination, the more force you put on it. If we're driving down the road in a steady cruise, there's a constant force pushing against that lever, trying to turn that tire out. So if that tire's trying to turn out a little bit, what kind of toe reaction will we have? The tire will try to turn this way, 
Toe is going to do what? Toe is going to try to tow it out on a rear-wheel drive vehicle. So this is typically why we have toe-in specifications for the static alignment on a rear-wheel drive vehicle. Because as we're pushing the tire down the road with positive scrub radius, it's going to tend to want to tow it out. So we want it to get to zero when we balance everything out. So that's all good and stuff, but Jerry, what happens when we move to a front wheel drive vehicle? Well, the front wheel drive vehicle is going to be the exact opposite because instead of pushing it down the road, now we're applying torque to the tire and we're pulling it down the road. So it's going to try to tow in rather than tow out if we have a positive scrub radius. Now, I don't know about you, Lonnie, but when I learned about scrub radius, I, I'd never heard of scrub radius before. So uh, again, you set everything to the proper angle and now think about the forces acting upon it from the road. If the scrub radius is unequal side to side, that's gonna create a pull to one side or the other, especially when I'm applying power or if I'm applying the brake. And so the scrub, I, did, I was not aware of these levers applying pressure to my wheels dynamically through the road surface. So this was eye-opening to me, and, and you will get into that in a little greater detail here in a couple of more slides. Yeah, you're exactly correct. So if I'm an engineer, I'm going to try to set up a scrub radius, or I'm going to design a scrub radius around probably the steady cruise position, but I have to take into account that when I'm braking, um, the scrub radius is gonna actually force the tires in the opposite direction. Um, and, you know, I mean, so depending on how much load, if torque steers higher, if you have more torque on one wheel than the other, you can get a torque steer condition because maybe the axles are, you know, different length, whatever. Those levers play into a lot of things we see going on in a vehicle. So, you know, I have guys say, well, why don't we just engineer them with zero, zero scrub radius so it doesn't matter how you're driving it. Um, one of the problems with zero scrub radius is a kind of a squirmy feeling because the job of scrub radius, it's not just like an effect, it actually has the job of tensioning the steering components. So there's a little pressure on your steering components so that when you get ready to turn, uh, the uh, pitman or the uh, rack doesn't have to take the slack up. There's always going to be a little tension there. So it's going to tension the, the steering and get it ready to turn. Um, it also has, you know, uh, a little bit effect, especially on a, a rear wheel drive car in the older days with tapered wheel bearings of placing more of the weight on the inside larger wheel bearings. So all of that is still true. Um, Jerry, now zero scrub radius would cause kind of, they called it a squirm feeling or kind of a wandering feeling and it was kind of avoided for years. Uh, what have we found on some of the more modern cars with high torque steer applications? Well, as we started adding horsepower to front wheel drive vehicles, we found out that they would change lanes as we started to accelerate real hard. So we had to make some type of correction for that, right? And so we're always making corrections in engineering for things uh, that as we change the design of the car and the horsepower and the braking and things like this. Well, the Honda Civic R was about 300 horsepower. It would divert completely off the road as you got into the uh, power band and Honda engine engineers had to come back and they kind of figured out they probably used too much scrub radius in their original design but had no problem with it because of lower horsepower. So with the uh, 300 horses they had to go ahead and put that not negative or not positive but get as close to zero as they could. Then it pulled straight down the road perfectly under acceleration until you got into a turn. Then when you got into a turn, the tire squirm comes from having the, the pivot point right in the middle. You can picture it as pivoting on a marble. And so if you think your tire is on a marble, how, you know, how stable is that going to be? Not very as you start to turn. And it actually, what they found out is, is it tries to make one side of the tire spin faster than the other in a turn. And now instead of one wheel spinning faster, it's the tire itself is trying to separate. Uh, and so that's where the squirm came from. And that can get worse depending on the tire design as well. Absolutely. Let's talk about what changes because, okay, that's engineering. I haven't designed a car in my whole life, to be honest with you. I've fixed cars, repaired cars, and looked at them. 
Um, so what can change? Unintended changes to scrub radius can come from uh, this diagram here shows it really well. If we call this a stock tire with stock wheel offset, we see the tire center line meeting the road surface and we got the designed SAI angle coming down. This was our stock scrub radius. Okay, so um, the next picture over, I, I, I left the same amount of offset on the inside of the rim and that's typically pretty common because I got a ball joint right here or a tie rod in. I can't shove that tire underneath there too far. I'm gonna be rubbing on something. Um, but I put a much wider rim on there and I left the tire size the same. So as you can see, now I've shifted the tire center line quite a ways away from my SAI line and it gave me a lot more scrub radius. Now, if it's exaggerated like this, the larger the scrub radius, the more torque the outside lever is going to have for leverage. So if we started off with positive SAI, excuse me, scrub radius on this tire with a static spec, we probably had a, if it's rear wheel drive, we had a um, toe in on the alignment spec because this is going to try to tow it out the longer levers on the outside as we push on it going down the road. Now we have a much, much larger, longer lever on the outside because of our wheel swap. Um, this is gonna make a lot of difference on how much it's gonna push it as it tries to tow it out. Therefore, the stock spec of toe in is probably not gonna be enough or adequate. So toe in is gonna cause the outside of the tires to wear. So I see Paul had that in chat. I just wanna throw that out there. So it could be because our scrub radius line is further in and our scrub radius is, is a lot bigger. Now, the other thing can happen too on this particular one, we changed the wheel offset and we screwed it up too, but we screwed it up so bad we went from a positive scrub radius to a slightly negative scrub radius. That's gonna change the dynamics altogether because we had a toe spec that was towing it in when it was positive scrub radius. Now we have negative scrub radius. We put it to the same spec. It's gonna to continue to tow it in and it's gonna make it even worse. Here's what happens with um, tire size too has an effect on it. Um, I have a stock size tire here and the scenario that I'm painting here is that the stock rims were pretty appealing to the eye or the customer didn't have the extra 300 bucks a pop so they plus sized a tire using the stock rim. So when you plus size a tire we went from this stock size tire with a SAI line and a tire center line with a slight positive uh, scrub radius to as the tire grows, now the contact of the road surface is way down on these. So we went from a slightly positive scrub radius to a negative scrub radius by increasing the tire size without changing the wheel offset because we left the stock wheels on. The opposite is true when we come to uh, reducing the tire size. Um, if we leave it on stock rims, the scrub radius gets bigger. Okay, so we have some issues with either one of those. I hope you got it. I'm going to do an example. Um, actually, I'll ask you guys, can you raise your hand? Did that kind of make sense? So we can get into a little case study here if you guys just raise them hands. Um, so when we change offset, direct relationship to scrub radius. Man, we're moving the wheel center line out an inch. It's making an inch more or an inch less of scrub radius. When we're growing the tire size up and down, it's also going to change the scrub radius. Um, it's a little more forgiving than moving the wheel offset from side to side, but it's still going to affect it. Now, on lifted or bigger trucks, um, in the past, we got away with this because anytime you put on a larger tire like this, you always made the vehicle a little bit wider. Um, we knew nothing about scrub radius. We just didn't want it to tip over because it's taller, we want it wider. We uh, lucked out and kept the scrub radius fairly clean. Um, let's take a, an example here. Jerry, finding all these specs for scrub radius can be difficult. Yes, usually it's a separate menu within our alignment machine. So as you just get used to running through caster camber and, and toe readings, you may not get into these menus. So some of this is going to be you searching out the different menus and finding where scrub radius lives, SAI, 
uh, included angle, all of these things. And of course, we're just, we're just talking about a very small slice of the pie here with scrub radius and SAI and tow out on turns. Uh, it would take us a whole different class to get into the symmetry of the vehicle, which is also gonna live in a different part of the menu as well. The one thing I just wanna add before you go into this next section is, uh, if you see a vehicle coming in and tires are hanging out over the fender wells three or four inches, they've really widened this thing out. Of course, it's throwing rocks and everything over their paint job. Uh, you know they've got a scrub radius problem already. But the biggest thing that I've learned is you may not have a spec for scrub radius. You may not be able to find a specs for scrub radius, but you want to make darn sure each side is equal. If they're equal, they'll cancel each other out. If they're not equal, we're going to have a pull one way or the other. And like you said, what you were saying, if you put a bigger tire on there and now the scrub radius went from positive to negative, that is a very no-no because the specs that were designed for that vehicle had, were designed for a positive scrub radius, you towed it in. And now when you go to a negative scrub radius because of your tire, you're trying to push it in. So you've towed it in and the dynamic forces are pushing it in. And so now it, everything is working against you. I just wanted to clear that up just a little bit. That's good. Hey, Tyler, I seen your question in chat, the little difference between wheel offset and, and backspacing. I did, I, my terminology might be a little bit different, but from the tire center or the rim center line, um, the offset's gonna be the measurement from the center point. Uh, it's gonna be positive or negative. Um, and the backspacing be, would be from the mounting flange to the inner side of the tire. So we see the suspension components didn't change in relationship to the inside of the rim we put a wider tire on there. So I, I call this backspacing. So I'll show you, that's kind of important. That was a good question to ask because we got a truck coming up that's got a problem um, uh, as we go Ronnie, through it. Yes, sir. Ryan, real quick, can uh, my buddy don't want to ask the effects of uh, the side of the lever versus a rear, from a rear wheel drive versus a front wheel drive. Can you elaborate on that a little bit for him just to clear it up? I will. Um, and, and the idea is when it's a front wheel drive car, the wheel is actually turning the road. And on a, uh, did I say front wheel drive? I meant to. On a front wheel drive car, the, the wheel is actually, the tire's actually turning the road. Where it's a rear wheel drive, the road is turning the tire. So the forces switch when we're going down the road at steady cruise from propelling the vehicle, which would be pulling on the lever or uh, just pushing the tire down the road, which the road would be pushing on the lever. So that's, that's very good, very good question. Uh, Jerry said we can't always find these specs. I get it. One of the things I look at is I, it's like anything else um, I've set through your classes, Brandon, you tell me to look at known good vehicles. And, uh, you know, with my scan tool, with my Pico scope, with anything or my, my uh, e-scope, whatever I'm doing, I'm trying to look at known good vehicles so I can kind of get a database or an idea what's normal. Uh, scrub radius is kind of like that. We're using trucks as an example today because we're just gonna, it's too much to get into everything, but, but this is a light duty truck. It's a Silverado. Um, it's got close to two inches of scrub radius and it's got two inches of positive scrub radius. Um, that's something that I could say is really common with the trucks that I align. Uh, Toyotas, uh, everything is gonna have a uh, four wheel drive truck is gonna be somewhere around two inches of positive scrub radius. Um, what I've done here is I've took an example from this Silverado to try to get a baseline. Uh, this particular one's never been modified. It's got stock tires, stock rims on it. Uh, one point inches of 1.8 inches of scrub radius is what I see from side to side. And like Jerry said, that's very important that it's even. Um, this truck has an adjustable control arm, which also can influence your scrub radius different from side to side, depending on the camber. Uh, adjustment on the control arm affecting that SAI line um, and moving it, you know, so it can definitely be. So you want to make sure the alignment set good before. Uh, and this one is. So how the alignment machine gets the scrub radius is it, it gets the SAI angle when you do the caster sweep. Uh, one thing I've done to try to improve my caster sweep is make sure I start the vehicle during the caster sweep. Um, I start the vehicle, I put the brakes on, and then I put a brake depressor on it. So when you're doing a caster sweep, you can't have any tire roll. I start it and let the power assist of the brakes actually build up the pressure of my calipers and drums or both calipers, whatever. And it holds that wheel in place 
um, so it doesn't roll during my caster. So then I'll shut it off and do my caster sweep, but I push down that brake when the engine's running, so I have assist and hold that brake and it helps it. So it establishes the SAI line. It knows where the outside of the tire is because the outside of the tire is, is, is where the sensor's mounted, so it knows where that is. And what it's left to determine to figure out is the tire center line. And what we do with the, this alignment machine is we dial in the rim width. And so it needs to know how wide that rim is. We measure it, we go ahead and we dial it in. This one was eight and a half inches. Um, and that's how we came up with our scrub radius on this. As we move forward, so this is a stock one. Remember, this is kind of what we're looking at. Here's one that came into uh, the school at our alignment rack here, and, and it's had some alterations on it. So just to kind of walk through this, I appreciate you guys are still on here. Uh, this one has a very small increase in tire size. So as we've seen on a truck, the taller the tire on the same rim would reduce scrub radius, right? Uh, this one has very little uh, gain in tire height, but it's got a new rim package on it. We went from 17 and a seven and a half inch rim to an 18 by 10 and a half inch rim. So we had three inches wider on the rim with very little of an offset correction. So the stock tire, 31.7, seven and a half inch rim, the offset from the center of the rim was out 28 millimeters. So that meant it pushed the tire underneath the vehicle from the stock position, 28 millimeters. When we switch to the new rim, of course, we got a little bigger rim, but that's not gonna play any effect in scrub radius, but it's three inches more wider, but we have the offset being from the center 18 millimeters out. So we've changed the offset. It doesn't quite push the tire far enough in anymore. Um, it's pushing it out a little more, which is good. It, it's changed it from stock, but only about a half an inch because 10 millimeters isn't that much. So the reason I made a big deal out of that is because we put three inches of rim on this thing that wasn't there before, but we only moved it out about um, a half an inch. So we need to kind of keep that in our mind as we get to our alignment specs here. So this is what we've done basically, like we did before. We, very little tire height increase. I'm just using the same illustration here. Um, the uh, offset corrected a little bit um, of the rim, but basically we stuck our extra two and a half inches on the outside of the tire. So that's gonna move our tire center line over. So what would you guys expect is going to happen to scrub radius under this scenario? Is it going to get bigger, smaller? Uh, what, what's going to kind of be that? We'll just throw that in chat real quick while we're talking about it. But it's going to move it out in this scenario. So if we had positive scrub radius here, it's going to get bigger or small. It's going to be, it's going to be much larger, right? So I have much more scrub radius on the front. And I didn't correct with a larger tire to reduce any of that off. Didn't do that on this one. Okay, so I basically just moved the rim over and left the scrub radius there. So let's look at the alignment spec. Um, I have fairly even from side to side. Uh, SAI uh, is, is fairly even side to side. So my camber adjustment is in there fairly close. But I have 4.3 inches of scrub radius, meaning I've moved that handle further in. It's way larger on the outside now than it used to be. Uh, what do you guys think some of the driving ability and problems are going to be with this truck? Let's just throw some things up in chat if you guys are still hanging in there. Okay, so if I have a large scrub radius on a rear wheel drive, then the scrub radius is positive. That's going to put the longer handle out on the outside of the tire the road's gonna push on that handle on a rear wheel drive and it's got a lot more leverage. So it's gonna to tend to do what? It's gonna to tend to tow it out a little more, right? It's got a lot more force than it did before. Um, so what do you think the customers were? Let's see, harder steering, uh, pulling to the right maybe because a little bit, right? Uh, wearing the tire quickly. This vehicle, that was a good one there because this vehicle had multiple attempts with, those, with that tire package on there, and it always seemed to, to wear the tires. So I'm gonna ask you a little bit later which way it's towing in and out so we can figure out where the tires are wearing. Uh, but yes, look at the scrub radius. It's a massive difference right there. So I like Robert, uh, he had put up in chat under braking concerns too, because you know, I mean, we think about this, we're, we're concerned about tow and because we're talking about the alignment right now, but 
man, you start shifting those levers, things go sideways or different way faster when you're braking too, because you switch the force on that tire. So the larger those levers, a lot more influence it's going to have on braking as well. Lonnie, we've got a great question in Q&A from okay. uh, Sean. Uh, says, Lonnie, Lonnie just said that swapping the room from 17 to 18 won't really affect the scrub radius. Is this right? So maybe we want to clarify that. Yeah, I, I do. I want to clarify that. That's a good point. The, uh, the rim's uh, you know, diameter is not really what's affecting it. The, the tire height would. If the tire height changed, uh, that would affect scrub radius. The diameter being 17 or 18 won't make a difference, but the offset of that wheel would definitely make a difference. So if the tire package is about the same uh, wheel and tire height as it was before, the inch in the rim or the diameter rim is really not going to affect the scrub radius because it doesn't have any influence on where the ball joints are or the steering pivots are. And it really has no influence on where tire center is. And that's why it wouldn't make much okay. difference. But that's a good question. So does that follow, Lonnie, that if you have very little SAI, it won't affect it much? But if you've got a lot of SAI, like on a strut vehicle, it could affect it quite a bit? On your offset? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, on, well, on your on your scrub radius, according to yeah, well, I, I see what you're saying now. Yeah, well, it depends on the angle of the scrub radius, right? On the tire, on the rim offset, either in or out. If we start getting a bigger tire, our angle steeper, with a lot of uh, SAI, like on a McPherson strut. Um, so tire height increase can definitely or decrease can definitely influence that more than just if it's a couple of degrees on a short long arm. So yes, yeah, so it depends on the angle of those two lines, tire vertical and SAI, how far you deviate from that, how much of an influence it's going to have. Here comes a question, right? What do you do? What are you going to do to fix this? Um, you know, there are some equations out there. I'm working with some guys that have got some ways to calculate how much I'm going to change the static toe to get me a zero dynamic toe going down the road. Uh, but really, uh, guess what we're at here is, is, is this is going to be one of those situations where if you're going to change the static toe, um, I definitely have a conversation with my customer first and say, hey, the wheel and tire package you have is creating some difficulty in getting the toe setting because of scrub radius. Um, and just realize that now you kind of own tire wear. Once you've decided to do experimentation, uh, you know, the customer can throw it back on us that we may be the, the problem with that. So you can either correct the offset or not. Um, I don't like the use of spacers unless they're OEM recommended um, to, cor to correct those situations because of you know, the liability and the issues. I mean, once, uh, let me just tell you, a super lift spacer on Amazon is about 80 bucks and uh, whatever that other name brand is about 17 bucks. So you tell me which aluminum's better, right? So you don't know what quality you're gonna have there. Uh, there are a couple examples where the OEM actually used a spacer um, to go. Jerry, I'm going to turn it over to you for a little bit, and you can talk about them spacers if you want, or just go into our additional tips. Well, one of the things that Dodge had a problem with was the second second generation Dodge pickup would have a tendency to pull, especially when you hit the brakes. Now, they didn't drive that great going straight down the road, but when you started to hit the brakes, they would pull to one side or the other, and they came up with three or four different spacers that you would put on. So if it pulled to the left, you put the spacer on the right. If it started to pull that way, you put a thinner spacer on. And of course, if you put too thick a spacer on, now you gotta have longer uh, lug bolts, you know? So there's, there's some problems that way. But they actually had that from the factory. It was a 27 page document, if I remember right, when you were looking at that, uh, to try to solve that particular issue, not all built around spacers. But one of the things you wanna do is, you wanna make sure that that all the components are solid before you start making adjustments. You want to make sure that everything is solid, nothing is bent, and that the best thing you can do on any vehicle before you make a modification is take the toe out on turn measurements and take your scrub radius before you start putting on lift kits and new steering knuckles and things like that. If you have a pre-recorded spec 
then you know what you're shooting for. So when you're done, if you have a problem, whether you got tire wear, you can look back at your scrub radius and see if you need to adjust for that. Now, if you need to adjust for scrub radius, the easiest way is your wheel offset. Now that may not be the least expensive way because wheels are, are getting costly, but that is the easiest way to fix a scrub radius problem. Did I miss anything, Lonnie? I don't think so. I was just going to hit something in chat. It took me an hour to type it in there, but Tyler said you're making Wrangler McGuy's mad right now, and I get that. But, you know, a lot of the Euro applications, they take a little different approach. Mercedes does to the dynamic angle. They'll actually have a toe spreader or a wheel spreader that goes in there and actually tensions to try to mimic the force of the road on the tires as it's going. You set your, your toe with the spreader in there. Uh, I I would you know, if you got a big modification, you like the, you know, the rims and tire package on the vehicle, uh, like those Wranglers, I love them. Um, you may try one of those spreaders to try to mimic the dynamic toe to see how far off uh, the, the factory spec on the alignment rack is. So um, guys, just to kind of, kind of hit where we've been today, uh, you know, you can only trust them specifications when things aren't shifting, when it's going down the road. Um, you can't trust your toe angle around corners if something's bent. Um, and uh, anytime scrub radius has made a large, uh, you know, change from where, you know, because of modifications or whatever like that, that really makes our static toe kind of worthless in those cases, and we can end up with tire wear issues. And of course, always best practices doing um, alignments and repeatability on angles. Uh, if you're doing a caster sweep, do it twice and see if it comes back to the same. If you've done an adjustment on caster or camber, uh, don't trust what your screen says. Do a caster sweep, do a jounce, um, and see if you can repeat that before getting too far into the diagnostic angles of that. So Randy, I think I'm done talking. I'll let you take over here, sir. Thank you guys for being here. I want to thank everybody out there for attending this week. I see we've got some repeats here and that's great to see you come back. Um, just so you know, when you want to watch future events, uh, go to CTI online and search training and then virtual classroom. Our um, future schedules are there. And of course the recordings from previous webinars are there also. So we'll see you again real soon, I hope. Uh, please be safe and please enjoy the weekend and uh, thank all of you for what you do every day. Thanks guys. So. Absolutely. See you soon. Absolutely.